Welcome back to Rattlesnake TV, guys. In this video, we're going to be watching some predictions and reactions to Kamala Harris's recent speech where she laid out her economic plans, which largely mirror what Joe Biden was doing. Here's Kamala explaining what four years of Joe Biden has done to the American economy. Everyday prices are too high. It feels so hard to just be able to get ahead. The bills add up. Food, rent, gas back to school clothes, prescription medication, the cost of food. A loaf of bread costs 50% more. Ground beef is up almost 50%. There's a serious housing shortage. The price of housing has gone up. It's too difficult to build and it's driving prices up. It is out of reach. The size of down payments have gone up as well. Costs are still too high. There's mu not much left at the end of the month and prices are still too high. Well said. Now, Vivek Ramaswamy has been highlighting this for a while now and doing what Republicans in most cases are failing to do, which is going on the news and big platforms and laying out and obliterating Kamala Harris's economic record and strategy, and also detailing why it will be an absolute disaster. He's one of the only people who hasn't been pulled away and who has been laser focused on this very important issue. So here's a few clips of him speaking on this over the past few days, which has aged very well. I heard Kamala Harris say to a reporter over the weekend, my economic policy is coming out this week. What do you anticipate it'll look like? Look, I anticipate it's going to look like something completely the opposite of what her record actually is. We don't need to wait for it, though, Kaylee. We already know what her economic policies are. She favors a tax on unrealized capital gains. That is a formula for a stock market crash and a second Great Depression. And just for people at home to know what that means, that means if you're a farmer and you own a farm or you own a small business, in many cases, you will have to pay taxes that you do not have the cash to pay because it's an unrealized capital gain. That's economic catastrophe. Another economic policy, saying she would get rid of the filibuster to ram through the Green New Deal, which would replace air travel with train travel, which would establish a single-payer health care system. She also favored nationalizing health care in a bill co-sponsored by Bernie Sanders, something I think Republicans have not gone after her enough for. So, you know, they talk a lot about weird, Kaylee. You know what I think is weird? I think abolishing air travel is weird. I think abolishing private health insurance is weird. And I think that a lot of these positions, the Green New Deal to abolishing the coal industry, are downright weird, not because it's an attack on other Americans, but because those are policies that hurt all Americans. So that's where I come out. And I do think we have not actually gone after her heavily enough on her policy record. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we're going to win this. Quick interruption, guys. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoy this information and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Let's get back to the video. Especially in the tech sector, you have people sitting on large, long-standing embedded capital gains. And so for people to understand what this means, it means you have to pay taxes on sales that you have not yet made. And even forget the stock market and think about even everyday Americans across this country. That means that if you're a farmer or if you're a small business owner, you will owe taxes with cash you literally do not have in your pocket to pay those taxes. That is a formula for a second Great Depression. And it is something that's been in the bloodstream of democratic policy for a long time. Go back to Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders' plans of a wealth tax, even in the 2020 primary. I think this idea is here to stay for the Democrats. That's a big one. I think Tim Waltz's selection as vice president says a lot. That's the first real presidential style decision we've seen Kamala Harris have to make. She went with somebody who at the state level has favored increasing taxes on capital gains. In that case, it was unrealized, but they have talked about unrealized gains and taxing them. And I do worry about that, what that means, not just for the stock market, but for everyday Americans. The across stock the market, country. if there's not 60 votes for that in the Senate, the stock market doesn't have to price it. Yes, 60 votes or if you agree. <laughs> I mean, well, right. I, I respectfully disagree with one aspect of that, because Kamala Harris has been the chief proponent of ending the filibuster to ram wow. through her policy sure. objectives. Yeah. And so if she's the president of the United States, and in my view, God forbid, a Democratic Senate to aid her, that could be 51 votes. And could you get to 51 votes on a major change in tax policy like that? I think the answer is absolutely yes. I think that's conceivable. And so for a lot of business leaders across the country, one of the questions they might want to ask is, which is going to be the administration that's more friendly to business? Well, we don't know where she stands on tariffs. We don't know where she stands on a lot of other questions. But on tax policy alone, the idea of not just raising tax rates, but raising tax rates and applying taxes on unrealized income, that is a catastrophe of epic proportion. So Kamala Harris has now stated her plan to tackle the cost of living crisis in the United States. Through a decree, from the 1st of November, there will come into effect a maximum price by which goods can be sold to the public. El establecimiento del marcaje 
what we call the installation of fair price for the people of all products. And from 1st of November... Sorry, wrong clip. That was Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela, announcing his plan for price controls. Here's Kamala. And I will work to pass the first ever federal ban on pr price gauging on food. Donald Trump is calling this the Maduro plan. She's running on the Maduro plan. We call it the Maduro plan, like something straight out of Venezuela or the Soviet Union. This announcement is an admission that her economic policies have totally failed and caused really a catastrophe for our country and beyond that, a catastrophe in the world. Even the Washington Post is calling out Kamala on this plan. They say when your opponent calls you a communist, maybe don't propose price controls. Vake Ramaswamy tweeted, Kamala's plan to empower the FTC to go after vaguely defined price gouging is idiotic. And if I'm totally honest, I really hope that this will also remind our side that expanding the power of three-letter agencies like the FTC is an awful idea, no matter which party proposes it. And whilst you might think it's not a bad idea because prices have gone up a lot, and when it comes to monopolies, price gouging can be a problem. The reality is that it will only make the problem worse because you're not fixing or addressing the underlying problem of inflation that causes the price increase in the first place. Here's a great video of American entrepreneur David Freiberg completely flaming this policy with receipts. Freiberg, what's your take on this reported by the Washington Post and I think confirmed by Politico uh, move by Kamala Harris? Thank you for to asking. Price thank, mix. Thank, thank you for asking. Do you asking, have any feelings on it? Yes. Yeah. I unequivocally hate socialism. Socialism destroys innovation, destroys productivity, and destroys individual liberties. Agriculture and food markets have insanely competitive dynamics because there are commodity markets, there are tons of competitors, there is no monopoly in making food, there is no monopoly in making CPG products, there is no monopoly in retail, there is no monopoly in grocery stores. It is a small margin, highly competitive, highly fragmented, free market, and the free market works in that everyone is always competing with each other, creating new productivity improvements, and as a result, over time, prices come down, except when the government intervenes and gets involved. So I would argue that the real cause of price inflation in food is not the supposed price gouging by corporate players in the ag and food industry, all of whom are deeply competitive with one another, but rather is the result of the inflation associated with government spending and stimulus coming out of COVID. Nick, exhibit one, the Fed balance sheet. From COVID to today, the Fed balance sheet grew from $4.2 trillion to $7.2 trillion, a growth of 70%. The Federal Reserve went out and they bought assets and they issued debt to banks and introduced liquidity into the system. If you go to the next slide, as a result, the M2 money supply increased from $15 trillion to 20, 21 trillion since COVID, a 40% increase. Okay, so now there is more money in the system, so the cost of everything should go up, which is exactly what we've seen. We can walk through a couple of the other commodity price charts from the St. Louis Fed. Here is the price of electricity. As an example, the price of electricity has gone up a little bit less than the M2 money supply. But the truth is, when you start to actually look at ag commodity prices over time, What's happened is there was certainly a boost coming from COVID, but the competition and the challenges in overproduction in the ag markets have started to hit and started to bring prices back down. So here's the price of strawberries. Strawberries today are selling for less than they were pre-COVID. Potatoes are now back to where they were pre-COVID. Now, let me give you some statistics on some of the supposed price gouging companies in the industry. Kraft Heinz stock pre-COVID was 29 bucks a share. Today, Kraft Heinz stock is 34 bucks a share. 2019 revenue of 25 billion, 2023 revenue of 26 billion. EBITDA on 2019 of 6.1 billion, EBITDA on 2023 of 6.3 billion. There's not a lot of profit gouging. In fact, Kraft Heinz has not been able to keep up with the inflation. Starbucks, which we just talked about, their stock was at $90 pre-COVID and today 93 bucks. 2019 revenue of 26 billion, operating income of 4.1 billion, 2023 revenue of 36 billion, but operating income only 5.9. Margins have come down in Starbucks. Nick, if you pull up the McKinsey chart, this is a study of the grocery industry, the state of grocery in North America, 2023 by McKinsey. 
accelerating pressures on profitability to cope with the pandemic's upheaval. Grocers have had to dramatically increase capex, increase supplies. As a result, they've seen a significant impact on margins. Here's the margin profile pre-pandemic and today. Gross margin has declined by two points from 47.6 to 45.6. EBITDA margin has declined by one and a half points. And now let's just go to the final chart, which is CPG companies, the companies that make food and sell it to consumers. As you can see, during the COVID era, the three-year rolling TSR has declined since COVID across the board. So food companies are seeing food prices come down. So farmers are really suffering. Labor costs have tripled since the pandemic, but they're still having to sell products at the same price. CPG companies have lower margins and supermarkets have lower margins. So there is nowhere in the ag or food supply chain that we are seeing fundamentally price gouging or profit taking happening. What has happened is the cost of labor, the cost of moving stuff around, the cost of fuel, the cost of electricity, the cost of goods has all risen with inflation because of the increase in the money supply and federal spending and the stimulus associated with the Federal Reserve buying assets onto their balance sheet. So arguably, I would say that trying to step in and cap prices will reduce competition and as a result, will reduce investment in improving productivity. And we have seen this countless times with every socialist experiment in human history has started with caps on food. And it has resulted in bread lines like you see in the image behind me today, as we can see in Soviet Russia. This is a mistake. It is a problem. It is anti-American. It is anti-free market. It is anti-innovation. It is anti-productivity. And ultimately, it's anti-liberty. And I cannot stand it. That's my rant. So back to the interview now with Kaylee and Vivek, where they discuss the difference in private sector experience between the candidate on both sides and the VPs on both sides. This is a very important point. Vivek, I saw a stunning graph in the New York Times today, and it is the fact that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz, between the two of them, Look at their private sector experience. You see private sector experience there in red. You see Trump, you see J.D. Vance. They have a ton of it. Zero is the private sector experience by Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. What does that say to you? It's estimated that they're not ready to run the government if they haven't run anything in the private sector either. The reality is their economic policies also reflect it, Kaylee. The fact of the matter is if Kamala Harris does as good of a job with the economy as she did with the southern border when she was in charge of that, then we are heading for a national catastrophe, a second Great Depression. And this isn't just bad for Republicans. This is something that's bad for all Americans, including the so-called communities of color that she claims she wants to serve. This is our path to victory. Is ultimately, do you want more money in your pocket? Do you actually want illegal mass migration into this country or not? End rampant crime and stay out of World War III. You have a choice. It's Donald Trump, even if you don't agree with him on everything. But I think the more we make this about policy, Kaylee, the more likely we are to succeed. And the less we make it about policy, I think the worse it's going to be for us. And so that's my warning to our side. If we yeah. need it, I think we're going to be successful. Wise advice. So when you think about it, this is a big problem. When you have people who don't actually understand how the real world works and when they're more interested in pandering than they are about implementing policies that will actually make a positive difference. Trump, Vance and Vivek for that matter, are all successful businessmen who understand economics deeply and can go into contentious situations and interviews and debate these matters, which Kamala and Tim Waltz will not do. Kamala has absolutely no idea. And if you needed any more proof of just how much of an ignorant puppet she really is, then have a listen to her explaining how much she loves equity. It has to be about a goal of saying everybody should end up in the same place. And since we didn't start in the same place, some folks might need more equitable distribution. Giving resources based on equity, understanding that we, we fight for equality, but we also need to fight for equity, understanding not everyone starts out at the same place. So there's a big difference between equality and equity. Equality suggests often everybody should get the same thing. Well, that often assumes everybody started out in the same place, as opposed to equity, which is everyone should end up in the same place. And if you then understand not everybody started out in the same place, you understand some people need more. So we all end up in the same place, right? We are proud of the fact that equity is one of our guiding principles. Proud of the fact that we understand equality is important, but not everybody starts out on the same base. We see that people in our country are having an experience 
that is not equal. So when we talk about the work we are doing here together, it is recognizing that and being guided by this principle of what we must do in the spirit and in the interest of equity. To put equity firmly at the center of our economic policy. But no, if you look at the, the reality of who will benefit from certain policies, when you take into account that they're not starting at, at, at the same place and they're not, stand, they're not starting on equal footing, it will directly benefit black children, black families, black homeowners. That is the rhetoric of somebody who is a first year college student campaigning for safe spaces for students of color and queer students, and not somebody who is campaigning to run the greatest empire to ever exist in human history. So in summary, I think that it's a positive thing for Trump. I think whenever Kamala Harris opens her mouth, it just gives the Republican side more ammunition. So let's hope for more public appearances from Kamala. If you haven't liked the video and subscribed to the channel, that would be appreciated. And if you want to watch another one right here. Till next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.